Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yeah. I can't hear myself, sorry. Welcome on behalf of Griffin and King and HCB Hayden Solicitors. Hope you all enjoyed your lunch. Um, now that you've been fed and watered, we're going to feed your brain a bit later on. Well, so I'm told. Um, housekeeping rules, if there is a fire alarm, it is real. So please exit to the car park as quickly as possible and I'll be right behind you. <laughs> no, not in front. I'm not allowed to go in front, sorry. Um, there are some photographs being taken today. I, please put your hand up if you've got objections. Anybody got any objections to filming? No, no filming? Nobody want to be a star? Okay, fine. Right, move on to what you've the, one of the moments that you've really, really come for today. If you can please put your hands together and give an extremely warm welcome to Tim Caulfield, Managing Director of Griffin and King. Thanks, Janet. Um, right, let's just get this uh, technology started, and we can uh, we can we can move on. Right. So, thanks. Good afternoon, and welcome. As Janet says, my name's Tim Caulfield. I'm managing director of Griffin and King. I'm a chartered accountant. I'm an insolvency practitioner, and I'm a law graduate. After qualifying as a chartered accountant, I spent around 20 years advising business owners about how to run profitable businesses, and in more recent years, I've specialised in rescue and recovery and debt advice. Griffin and King are a specialist firm in all aspects of business rescue and recovery, including personal and corporate insolvency. We don't do anything else. We don't have a accounts department. We don't have an audit department. We don't have a tax department, and we certainly don't do loans. So we operate in a very specialised niche market. And to emphasise this point, we get introduced to our clients at the most difficult stage of their lives. Our clients tell us we show empathy, compassion, consideration, and above all, professionalism to guide them through a very difficult period of their lives. But don't take my word for that. Have a look at our website and see the testimonials from our clients yourselves. And here's a few recent ones. Why are we here today? Most of you either advise business owners or individuals in one capacity or another, or are in business yourself. This talk will give you a flavour of what we do and how we can help you to help your clients. So that brings me to today's talk, Negotiating the Insolvency Maze, Griffin and King Rescue Tales. When a company becomes insolvent, the rules relating to what directors should do change immediately. And these are rules that most business people are not familiar with. So it's so important to tread carefully because there can be serious implications if directors get it wrong. During the talk, I'll have a couple of questions for you and some very fine prizes. So listen out for them. And the talk will take around about 20 minutes. My talk today will run through two main areas. There's Terry and June. That's a recent rescue case that we'll go through in some detail. It shows the positive side of insolvency and how a difficult position can be turned into a positive outcome. And the case highlights the dangers of unnecessarily complicated accounting structures, borrowing money and not having reliable accounting information. And then I'll talk about borrowing, which highlights the dangers of borrowing money from the perspective of an insolvency practitioner and what happens when things go wrong. So, Terry and June. And here's the first of my questions for a very good bottle of wine um, endorsed by Griffin and King. What was the surname of these two fictitious sitcom characters? Craig. That's right. A, uh, a bottle of wine at the end of the presentation for this young man. That's one of my dad's favourites. So, the rescue mission is about Terry. June is actually Terry's accountant. Terry was the managing director of a company that sold used cars. He'd been in business for, for many years and was something of a local celebrity because everybody knew him. And as you can expect, he had, he had lots of mates. 
Terry's IFA, Richard, had been having various discussions with Terry over a period of time about the financial position of the company, and Richard was becoming increasingly concerned. Terry wasn't sleeping at night, and Richard managed to persuade him to have a meeting with me. And here's a few more details about the case. There was a confusing structure to the business. This structure had been set up a few years before by June. There were two limited companies and one partnership. There was another person, Bob, who was a co-director in one company and a partner in the partnership. There had originally been some rationale to this structure, but this had been forgotten about a long time ago, and things just muddled on, which didn't really matter until the company became insolvent. And as you might expect, the books and records were in a terrible mess, and it was difficult to see, in, see which entity actually owned the cars. And you might think that Terry or Bob could throw some light on this question, but they couldn't and June wasn't much help either. There was a loan from the bank of approximately £100,000 secured by way of a debenture in one of the companies and on Terry's matrimonial home. There were several private investors' loans, that's his mates, of around £70,000 and in particular there was an unsecured loan from the farmers, and I'll tell you more about the farmers in a minute, of £150,000. There's much talk these days about how difficult it is to get finance, but not for Terry. He seemed to have mates in every town that were only too pleased to lend him money, and not for insignificant amounts, £10,000 here, £20,000 there, and then there were the farmers. The farmers weren't even his mates, they were friends of a mate, and they lived in Yorkshire. They'd never even met Terry, and they lent him and his co-director through the company £150,000 and said he could have more when he needed it. Terry showed me a loan agreement with the farmers. The farmers' solicitor had drawn it up. It was supposed to be a chattel mortgage secured on the stock of cars so that if the company failed, the farmers would take possession of all the cars to satisfy their debts. Even Terry could see that this agreement didn't do what it was supposed to do. As far as I was concerned, it was an unsecured loan. I'm pleased to say my solicitors agreed with me, and I'm pleased to say, Charles, I used HCB. That reminds me, I must check whether I paid the bill. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. I'll get, on to the I'll get on the case this afternoon. There were other unsecured creditors amounting to around about £50,000. Stock levels were realistically stated at around about £60,000. So it surprised me when Terry told me that the draft accounts that June had prepared for the year ended 31st December 2011, which was only a few months before, showed stock levels at nearly £200,000. Terry told me that the stocks in these draft accounts was overstated considerably, and apparently June knew this. Even with the inflated stock levels, the companies were insolvent by over £100,000. Without the inflated stock levels, they're insolvent by at least 250000 June, remember that's the accountant, was pressing Terry to approve the accounts and submit them to Companies House. Goodness knows why. The company had lost around £50,000 since the last balance sheet date. Based on our review of overheads, it appeared that the company was now losing £1,500 a week, and Terry owned the site personally from which the business traded. Terry was frantic. He was worried that he was likely to lose his home, and he was also worried about the farmer's reaction to the fact that they weren't going to get their money back. Terry's immediate reaction was that he wanted to borrow some more money, like he'd done in the past, and keep on trading. Terry approached his bankers, who said they'd be happy to lend him some more money, as a personal loan, of course, that would be fully secured on his home, which, of course, also belonged to his wife, who had nothing to do with the business. He also had a couple of mates lined up to lend him some more money. Richard and myself managed to persuade Terry to consider an insolvency option. This would mean he'd buy back the stock either through himself or one of his mates, at a proper current market value, cut down his overhead significantly, 
let out part of the site and rethink his marketing strategy. Richard and Terry did some budgets which showed that this restructured business could trade at a profit of around about £750 a week. So once Terry had made the decision to go down the liquidation route, his two major concerns were the bank and the farmers. I spoke to Terry about the bank situation and said that the bank would most likely reschedule the debt, providing Terry made some realistic proposals. I'd speak to the bank in the first instance to explain the position so the bank wouldn't look to repossess his property. So that left the farmers, who were the major unsecured creditor. And remember, they thought they owned the stock and didn't really see what was coming. We agreed that Richard and myself would go over to Yorkshire to meet the farmers face to face and explain the position. On the day of the meeting, Richard and I met up on the M1 services in Leicestershire. We agreed it'd be best to go in one car and Richard suggested that I follow him for a few miles to find a convenient parking spot to leave his car. So that's what we did. We left the motorway after a few miles and then went onto some minor roads for a few more miles and I was actually talking on the telephone at the time, hands free of course, and not really taking too much notice. And eventually Richard parked up in a pub car park and we headed off to Yorkshire. The meeting with the farmers was surprisingly amicable and in all the circumstances they were very sympathetic with Terry's position and supported the process. So, job done. After the meeting, Richard and I got back on the road and headed for home. We made good time and I was looking forward to getting back into the office for a couple of hours. And things changed when Richard casually said, can you remember where we parked the car? I really thought that with all the twists and turns we had made after we left the M1 services that morning that Richard was familiar with the roads. But I was wrong. It now appeared that he was as clueless as I was as to where we'd left the car. So we spent the next two hours trying to retrace our steps back to the pub car park without any success. And to make matters worse, the heavens had opened. So things didn't look too good and so much for getting back to the office that afternoon. We sat silently in the car thinking about what to do next. And eventually, Richard came up with a cunning plan. He'd go into a pub, describe the pub that we were looking for, and somebody, surely, would recognise it and be able to direct us. Simple. I said I'd prefer to sit in the car. But that's what he did. And surprise, surprise, a couple of minutes later, he came out with clear instructions as to how to find his car. Two weeks later, we had the creditors meeting, and one of Terry's mates successfully bid for the stocks. And Terry's now trading again, once again, from his own site, but this time he's actually making a profit. So just moving on and talking about borrowing, I know in the past I've spoken about this before, about the dangers of borrowing, and it's just something I see time and time again, and I think to emphasise caution when borrowing is always such a good thing. There's so much talk these days about the banks not lending, but I think in many instances, especially with smaller businesses, they're right to show caution. And the proprietor should also show caution and work carefully with his professional advisors before borrowing any money to put into the business. I was listening on the radio the other day to a business programme and proprietors of businesses were calling in saying, why do banks want personal guarantees when they're lending to a limited company? People need to get real if they're expecting banks to lend unsecured to their business unless they have a very strong balance sheet indeed. It just won't happen. And then when a loan is made, inevitably with a personal guarantee, and the business fails, the director will need to come up with an offer of repayment. And this can be difficult at a time when he's often just become unemployed and maybe having to think about lots of household belt tightening measures. I saw a company director the other day, Roger. I've been called in by his accountant, Val, to have a look at things. And before I tell you more about Roger and Val, you can probably guess there's another question coming up. And again, for another fine bottle of Griffin and King wine, what is the surname of these other two fictitious sitcom characters? 
So, yes, yes, uh, Sarah. Pardon? It's Stevenson. Yeah, absolutely right, Sarah. Well played. So there's a, a bottle of wine waiting for you after the end of the show. Well done, Sarah. So a few more details about the company. Um, and in many ways, this is a similar situation to Terry's, but as we'll see, with a very different outcome. The company had been struggling for around two years. The cash flow best estimate that Val produced showed that the company would run out of money in around six weeks. Both Roger and his wife were employed full-time in the business. We looked at the figures. During the last two years, the director and his wife had received remuneration of around £30,000, but had used their credit cards to inject over £60,000 in the business. So the net effect of all their efforts was that they had paid the company £30,000 to work for it and have all the stress that went with the problems of running a company. Historically, the company had been quite profitable when it was run from the family home a few years before. It was only when offices were leased and employees were taken on that profits collapsed. The advice that Val and I gave Roger was to liquidate the company and stop throwing good money after bad. If he wanted to restart the trade, he could downsize immediately by moving back home and Val would have helped him through that process. I could see the advice from both Val and I was something Roger didn't want to hear. He said he'd get back to me. That was a couple of weeks ago now. I spoke to Val again the other day and she told me he'd now managed to get an American Express card with a credit limit of 30,000 pounds. So I guess I'll be seeing Roger again in the new year when the money runs out and at that time he'll probably have to pay, sell his home to pay for the credit cards. And as you all know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And it's the same in business sometimes. And Roger is one of those people who just doesn't want to listen until it's too late. So what have we covered in today's talk? We've looked at how the best laid accounting structures can go hopelessly wrong. Good accounting, and it's usually good tax planning as well, can really help, but it needs to be strictly monitored to make sure it's working properly. A complicated structure, if it's not working properly, can turn into a nightmare, as any accountant will tell you. We've also looked at borrowing money, whether from a bank or from one of your mates, or from credit cards, borrowing money should only be done for the right reasons. To simply keep pumping good money into a black hole doesn't help anyone. Again, it's so important to have good accounting records, to assess the financial position of the business, and be close to professional advisors. The theme that runs through these stories is how much of a difference good professional advice can make, and often without charge. So, what do I want you to do? If you're aware that any of your clients or business contacts have issues like we've looked at today, that is a business is losing money, or getting out of control with debt, or an individual is getting submerged with debt, or you think we might have the expertise to be able to help in a particular situation, please speak to one of my, me or one of my colleagues. We're always pleased to have a chat or a meeting without charge to explore options and I'm sure we can help. What we're trying to avoid is a formal insolvency situation, but the next best thing is a structured, planned insolvency process of which the director or the individual can retain a good element of control. And just before I conclude, I'll ask my colleagues at Griffin and King to briefly stand and make themselves known. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. So if anybody wants a word with any of our people, then please have a word. And that brings us to the end of my talk. And Whoops, I think I overdid it there. There we are. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, Carol Remy from HCB Hayden Solicitors. I'd like to introduce Charles Underwood. Charles, many people know him in Walsall and around the West Midlands as being one of the leading employment lawyers in the area. Uh, he's also an education specialist as well. Uh, put your hands together and hopefully you'll find his talk very interesting.
Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's uh, titled an employment law update, but um, I thought I'd take a little different tack to uh, just giving you uh, some boring information about what's coming out uh, and a little bit of an insight into how we get to make sure that we know what's going on in the legal world. Um, as Carol rightly says, I'm a consultant now with the uh, HCB firm. Uh, we haven't quite got as many offices, I don't think, as those uh, which Mr. Caulfield had put on his screen, but we're getting close. Two more acquisitions uh, this week, and uh, we are now circling Birmingham and have a new office in Birmingham. In fact, uh, as we speak, uh, that has been a development over the last two weeks. Um, I've specialised in employment law and uh, have been doing it for about, ooh, I think, 12 years now, having seen a number of changes that have uh, come about. And it is probably a, an area which is growing uh, constantly. It's necessary for us to keep up to date because clients expect good advice on the phone at the drop of a hat. And we get information overload quite often from various sources. Uh, daily we get updates from uh, barristers' chambers, from uh, people who are in the business of updating us free of charge. And they, they give to us uh, quite a good uh, insight as to the commentaries that we need to look at. Because employment law contains magic words like reasonable, suitable, fair and just. Uh, all of which can mean anything to anyone. And courts and tribunals and appeal courts have to decide for us how cases are to be interpreted and how words are to be interpreted. And I thought it would be a little bit of an idea to drag a few of these reported cases together to hopefully show us a bit of entertainment this afternoon. Uh, some of them are interesting, some of them are entertaining, some of them, like this first one, are absolutely bizarre. This is a case brought by two care home workers who were employed on the night shift looking after vulnerable adults. And perhaps not surprisingly, it was an express term of their contract that they had to keep awake. And they didn't. And it was another express term of their contract that if they were found sleeping at night, then they would face disciplinary sanctions, probably resulting in dismissal. So when they were found sleeping on the job, they were formally dismissed. Proper procedures, and neither of them had the sufficient length of service to bring a claim for unfair dismissal. Why they want to do that uh, was probably at the beck and call of some shark solicitor, but we'll skip over that. So they had to come up with a good idea to be able to bring a claim for unfair dismissal. And how they did it is brilliant, absolutely superb because there is a right, as every employee has, to a rest break. And these workers said, we weren't given a rest break. Well, the whole of the job was just walking around and then going to sit down. So they had a rest break effectively whenever they wanted, but it wasn't written into their contract that they could have a specific rest break. And they argued that the reason that they were asleep was that they were protesting about the fact they hadn't got a rest break. And if, you're for, you for, if you refuse to forego a, a legal entitlement, that's automatically unfair dismissal. And it took seven pages of a judgment from the president of the appeal tribunal to say, effectively, don't be stupid. And they lost their case, fortunately. But it was an interesting one. I finally come out of the closet, and I am gay and proud. Mr. Otto... Maywo proves two things. Firstly, he is a good candidate for the long line of tradition of unpronounceable legal cases in employment law. But secondly, he was a, a good worker for the Carphone warehouse. And when he was out of the room, a couple of his mates decided that for a bit of fun, they would alter his Facebook. And they put on the words, I have finally come out of the closet, I am gay and proud. Now, neither I nor Mr. Oto Mewo is gay, and he was a bit upset about this, as was his parents, friends, and his female partner, 
and he did Carphone Warehouse for sexual orientation harassment. And they said, we didn't know anything about this. How could we do anything about it? We didn't know that they, these people were going to do it. So the tribunal said, too bad. You didn't take all reasonable steps, and therefore they were guilty of that conduct and were made to pay for it. Lesson there, make sure your policies are right, get up to date, and get your culture right. I'm convinced that the government, in its employment policy review, is being run by a work experience kid. <laughs> and the reason that I say that is that one of the things that they are looking to change are compromise agreements where employees give up their rights to go to a tribunal. And the best thing that they can come up with is to call them settlement agreements. Uh, that's a big change, I think, but that is effectively all that they are doing. I won't go into that, but it was sparked by this case of Hayward, which is a nice little reminder about the limit, the £30,000 limit, which you can give tax-free to an employee when they leave but it's got to be a legitimate £30,000. In other words, it's not contractual in any way. If it is contractual, it's taxable, and Hayward uh, confirms that. Some statistics from last year, 2011. The magic number is 4,445,023. That's pounds. That was the maximum award for a race discrimination claim and is the record in this country. And so I should be saying to you, make your appointment now. You should be squirming if you're an employer. So please come and see me and we will protect you, which is what a lot of non-lawyer uh, uh, employment law advisors uh, are saying. But it's a very misleading figure. The actual awards are very moderate. The average award for uh, Unfair dismissal. Anyone want to have a guess? I don't have any wine to give away. Anyone want to have a guess? Average, average award? No, it's, it's gone up. It's got nine now. It's 9,100 is the average. The median award, though, uh, is only 4,500. And except for this one, of course, the one that has skewed it, the race discrimination one, all other discrimination claims, the average award was below 20,000 pounds. Um, this is a nice little case, another one where you can't pronounce either of the names from what I can tell. Um, a stupid little employer in this particular case decided that he would take action against an employee and there were three reasons to dismiss him and they dismissed him for them. And the employee decided that he would appeal internally and did so and for some reason that I can't quite understand, on appeal the uh, person who dealt with it said, well, um, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I'll, I'll dismiss you for the one. And he dismissed him for one reason. And when he went to the employment tribunal at first instance, the employment tribunal said, well, actually, uh, that wasn't a good enough reason to dismiss him, but we could see that he'd done two other things, so we think that that's okay. The employment appeal tribunal said, no, if you pin your colours to the mast and tell him it's only for one reason, that's it. And he won his compensation. Uh, when I put these in, uh, I thought I was being very clever, actually, but this is a little bit complicated. There's been some cases about transfer, transfer of undertakings, which I think is quite an interesting area of the law, uh, all to do with contracting in and contracting out. And this is a situation just to explain it to you, so that in this particular example, it's clever, isn't it? In this particular example, we've got a situation where whatever I call them, grim and dirty, have a, a cleaner. And they decide that they don't want to directly employ the cleaner and they'll contract out uh, to another company. Under the contracting out rules, she goes along with the contract. So they still got her cleaning uh, the office. It works the other way around as well. So that if they want to bring her back in-house, then she follows and she continues to do the cleaning. The reason I've done both of those is that there is a case on each of them. Now again, I won't ask the question, but I thought that there would be not a lot of difference between the words group 
and grouping. And how wrong can I be? And poor old Eddie Stobarts learned a bad lesson. And very briefly, Eddie Stobarts had a warehouse and it serviced two customers. And Eddie's had, Eddie Stobarts had two shifts, the night shift and the day shift. And the night shift worked solely on one customer and the day shift worked solely on the other customer. And Eddie Stobarts decided that they would close this particular warehouse. And the day shift people were made redundant. But the night shift people were taken on by somebody else. In other words, I beg your pardon, the night shift work was taken on by somebody else. And I would have thought that those people on that shift would have gone over to the new company. But the court said no. There is a difference between group, which is just a, a section of people randomly selected, and grouping, which is the magic word, an organized grouping, which have been put together specially for that. And they said this was just an accident. I don't understand that, quite honestly. And I certainly don't understand this one, which is the difference between company directors and ordinary workers. This is a contracting in case. It was an Edinburgh Home Link case where Edinburgh Home Link did work for Edinburgh Council on their housing. And Edinburgh Housing, I think on Edinburgh Council, decided that they were going to take this work back in house and said, we'll take all the employees who were doing the work for us, the 40 of them, but we won't take the directors. They won't transfer over. The real reason was that they said that the principal purpose of the directors was not working for Edinburgh Council doing the housing work, it was working for the company, administering it, keeping it going. Now, I think that's wrong, personally, because the company was only in existence to do the housing work anyway. But who am I to argue? I'm very confused about it. Let's go on to a slightly different and lighter note to finish off with. Tim can talk about all his offices. I'll talk about sex. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> What have an HR advisor, a motel, some lights, and a lawyer got to do with this? And what do they all add up to? It's a bit of a shame that we don't practice in Australia, because this is an Australian case. And it's a classic. The HR advisor is employed by her employer, and she is sent off on a long-distance journey to go and help a client. And her employer books her into a hotel, a motel, and to while away the hours, this lady HR advisor goes to meet a friend, and they go back to the motel, and they have some uh, meaningful personnel discussions, I think they're called, during the course of which the light fitting above the bed broke, and there's some lovely bits. We all have to read this. It's a bit like employment law porn. You know, you just have to go into it to read the case. And there's some lovely bits in the judgment about uh, the question of um, who broke the light and how it came to be broken, but we won't go into those details here. And the lady uh, suffered an injury, and she argued that it was an injury suffered in the course of her employment. Let's do some hands up, okay? <laughs> Who would have said that was true? Go on. Who would have said it wasn't true? Okay. Well, you're all wrong. It turned on the question of whether the employer countenanced the fact that she would be having sex in a motel that they had booked. And would you believe on appeal in Australia, they said, well, they booked the hotel, and they hadn't told her not to, <laughs> so they must have countenanced it, and she won her damages. I like that case, don't you? <laughs> That's a bit of fun to end up with. 
all in all, it's quite tricky keeping on top of the law. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. And just to prove how up to date we are, this is the picture of our employment law department taken last week. Thank you very much indeed. Craig, if I could ask you to step forward and come and collect your wine, please. Enjoy. Know, though, Enjoy. <laughs> okay, if I could ask Sarah to step forward, please. Cheers, Sarah. Get. <laughs> Thank you. You can, get, you can get the check as well at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> Cheers, Sarah. Well played. Big check. Okay. <laughs> The check will be in the pen. <laughs> right, if I could ask Carol to step forward, please. Oh, yeah, well, Carol. I'll come over this side. Mm. Here we are. Mm. 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 Well played, Carol. Thanks for the help. Okay, Tim, now we are for the business card draw, so if you could right. oblige, please. Sure. Okay, yeah, right, well. Well, we have Robin Viner. Well done, Robin. <laughs> Congratulations, Robin. Have you won before? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many cards have you put in there? I don't want. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know how you do it. Right. And one more. All right, one more. Okay. okay, here's another one coming up. Right, this time we've got Tony Morris. Well done, Tony. <laughs> Congratulations, Tony. And there's your bottle of champagne. Well played. Cheers. Just a few more thank yous. Um, if I could thank the sound crew for doing an excellent job today, thank the hotel staff, and finally thank you all for attending. You don't have to rush off. There is food left outside, so feel free. Carry on to network. And wherever you're going, have a safe journey. Thank you very much. Where are you today and uh, what have you been doing? Well, we're at the Griffin King seminar talking about employment laws and insolvency. Uh, what was the highlight of the talk? Uh, it was quite entertaining about the employment laws and also what rather frightening sort of things that people get away with. <coughs> you know, you also, would you recommend the event? I would do, yeah. It's definitely a great event. I should ever come along to it if they can. Okay, so uh, tell us who you are and how you work. I'm Chris Toe, I'm a councillor at Walsall Council, I'm a cabinet member for finance and personnel. But uh, where have you been today and what have you been doing? Interestingly, I have held my networking event, gone fishing for business in Derby, and I've come here. Uh, what was the highlight of the talk today? I think both topics are very interesting. I mean, they're uh, something that one hopefully we never get involved in, clearly, uh, because insolvency is not something we want to be involved in. But I know Griffin and the King are a very good organisation, will help people not to get to that point. On employment law, again, any employer has to be mindful of what the law is saying. Clearly, I'm looking to see the change in employment law. You know, some of the laws that clearly aren't appropriate will be gone. I hope the Conservative government will get rid of those. But of course, we have to have laws, and, and that's how society runs. Of course, always very interesting. If you come away learning one thing, it's worth coming. I've learned something today. Okay, so tell us who you are and who you work for. I'm Robin Viner. I've got my own business as a chartered accountant in Kidderminster. Uh, where are you today and uh, what have you been doing? Well, I'm here today, that's the first thing I should say, Warsaw. I have been at a client's premises this morning doing some uh, bookkeeping and accounts for them and uh, obviously came over here for the lunchtime seminar. Uh, what was the highlight of the talk? 
Well, I thought both talks were very interesting. Um, one of the highlights was obviously the, the end with the case of the Australian case. It was very amusing and highly co highly controversial, I would have thought, in terms of, of the, the verdict. Whether that would have happened in the UK, I very much doubt. An interesting one. But uh, also the, uh, the two cases that uh, Tim mentioned concerning uh, the potential liquidations, the insolvencies that he... Uh, that he effectually rescued, or one of them did anyway. I thought those were very interesting and uh, obviously for me more more useful than the employment one. Uh, would you recommend the other? Of course. I think Griffin and King uh, put themselves about to, uh, to obviously advertise their wares and services uh, and I think that um, the more you can do that in the in the public eye, keep them, keep yourself as a firm in the public eye, doing a good job. The seminars are one way of doing that. Okay, so just tell us who you are and who you work for. My name's Sharon Sierra, and I work for HSBC Bank in Walsall within business banking. Where are you today, and what have you been doing? I'm at the uh, Village Hotel at Junction 10 in Walsall at a networking event and seminar held by Griffin and King and HCB solicitors. What was the highlight of the talk today? Highlight of the the afternoon has been the the seminar um, held by Tim and Charles, um, particularly the talk from Tim about borrowing from lenders. Obviously, working in a bank, it's quite quite useful to to know that customers are um, being supported by their professional advisors. So that could be their solicitors, accountants, and obviously the insolvency practitioners. Um, and they're advised to, to work closely with, with the bank as well when making decisions about borrowing. And would you recommend the event? Yes, definitely. Um, for, for business owners, professional advisors, um, anyone really who, who needs to, to keep up to date with um, current employment law and, and um, borrowing and anything within the financial market really. So yeah, definitely.